Call the meeting to order at 6.05 p.m. And if we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, put up the flag, that would be great. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. And welcome everyone to tonight's uh, August 12th Cahoba City School District Board of Education meeting. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can email them to boecomment at cahoes.org. And I'll turn this over to uh, roll call. Mrs. Giller? Excused. Mr. Pascal? Here shortly. Mr. Jackson? Here. Mrs. Dion? Here. Mrs. Carey? Here. Mr. Annalee? Also will be here shortly. And Mr. Nolan? Uh, with that, uh, turn it over to Dr. Spring. For the record, uh, Mr. Pascal has joined us. Oh, perfect. Welcome everyone and, and thank everyone for joining us this evening. I know it's a, a warm night and we appreciate you spending your evening with us, so thank you. So the district code of conduct, you may recall that last summer we had a major revision of our code. Uh, we had separate building codes and we did join them into one. So, so last year was a major revision and this year uh, there are no required updates. Um, anything related to COVID uh, um, is in our reopening plan and we will also include that in our um, plan for um, and, and our building handbooks. So, so just to review, what is a code of conduct? The code of conduct clearly defines ex expectations for ex acceptable conduct on school property and what are the possible consequences if there is unacceptable conduct and if there is discipline that is that is necessary consequences that it is administered promptly and fairly and that the code must support the dignity for all students and so our code absolutely does that um, and there were no updates. So uh, we are required to have a 30 day public comment period. It has been on our website for a um, little, maybe more than 30 days. And, and I have not received any inquiries from that. Um, we will be distributing the summary code to our principals and our principals will be sharing this with students and parents. And obviously in the opening days of school, we always review all of the protocols uh, especially through our, our PBIS model so that the expectation is clear. Are there any questions about our code? Okay. So updates for our, our reopening plan. So everybody is aware that Governor Cuomo has given us the green light, the permission to reopen as infection rates are below the New York State Department of Health threshold. So the governor said, based on our infection rate, schools are in the best possible situation right now. If anyone, anybody can reopen schools, we can reopen schools in New York State. So I have more information about that this evening. So we submitted our reopening plan to the state education department, as well as the New York State Department of Health. And on the governor's website, it does say that the Department of Health is reviewing plans and will notify districts if their plans are not approved on Monday, August 10th. So we have not received any information. We have not been contacted by the Department of Health, uh, but I'm still not taking that as a sign that our plan was approved. Um, but at this, at this time, uh, we have not heard from them. So I'm assuming that that's good news. So one of the requirements uh, that the governor has um, outlined for school districts to comply with is to hold virtual uh, meetings or panel meetings with uh, staff and parents. So we've already scheduled those. Our staff meeting is scheduled for August 17th, that is Monday from 11 to 1. 
Again, all of our district administrators will be on the panel and also Dr. Deterzi, so our school medical director. We're very fortunate to have her join us and advise us. Uh, she's been a, a key component to all of our reopening plans. We have parent meetings scheduled for August 18th at 6 p.m. Again, Dr. Deterzi uh, will be joining us for that evening meeting. Our administrators will be there, each one of them. And I tried to vary the time. So if somebody uh, maybe works nights, uh, I gave other opportunities for them to uh, attend other meetings. Um, and we will also record the August 18th meeting with Dr. Deterzi on that. So we've gone above and beyond the, what is uh, being required by the governor. Remember, we've already had virtual panel discussion meetings um, at the end of July with staff um, and with actually uh, students and, and our parents, but we are also going to hold uh, two additional ones, August 25th. Um, I see Mr. Annalee, so just for the record, uh, Joanna, she, uh, he has joined our meeting. Uh, so we've um, added August 25th and September 1 uh, to our meeting schedule. We are also developing frequently asked questions, FAQs, which we will be sharing with staff and parents on Friday, and then they will be posted on our website. So, so we've had a lot of questions with our feedback at cohos.org. We continue to get questions. We continue to answer them, but I also think that an FAQ on our website will be very helpful. So here is the big news, our opt-in survey results. So we've given parents a little bit of a grace period. So this week, parents have contacted our principals and said, you know what, I would really like to be um, considered and, and sign up my kids for the opt-in for the virtual learning. So we, we've allowed that. And at the same time, we've gotten some parents who have said, you know what, um, upon further consideration, we would prefer to have our kids in the in-person or hybrid um, model. So these are our numbers as of today. We will also give parents a little bit of a grace period after uh, they know exactly where, uh, what our plan is and, and what the model is for their, their children. And uh, we will allow them to make a, a last minute switch at that time as well. So here we are. 416 students, so 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 that's a, a big number, um, and uh, you can see that it was uh, very popular. I think the most at, at the middle school, but also if you look elementary wide, definitely, um, you know the numbers are pretty significant there. Um, also, we have students with IEPs um, who have also decided to to attend virtually. So what does it look like? So. So high school. So high school, as you know, will be on an every other day model. We have the blue team, they'll be in on one day and the gold team will be in on another day. So what we've been able to do is just model our virtual instruction um, to be very similar to um, that same schedule. So our virtual students will have period by period schedules, They'll be one day synchronous, which is live. They'll be with a teacher. And then the next day they will be asynchronous. They'll be recorded or posted lessons. So uh, we were able to create some, and again, I have to really thank all of my principals, um, my counselors. This has been a huge undertaking because again, we've had to create a new schedule and we've had to load students in um, according to, to uh, the virtual option. Uh, so, so huge shout out to all of our staff for, for really uh, going above and beyond. So we were able to create virtual sections of certain subjects. So just to give you some example, um, our counselors were in today at the high school working on ninth grade uh, classes. So algebra one, global one, living environment, English nine, studio art and consumer math. So these kids will all be in a class with a, a teacher who will be broadcasting out to them um, from mostly the high school. They will not have students in front of them. Okay, so the teacher will be utilizing, um, you know, either, either Google or Zoom or something of that nature uh, to broadcast out to these students. So these students will be home. So now you will ask, well, what about some of those sections where uh, maybe you didn't have enough for a virtual, a full virtual class. And, and that's obviously um, the case. 
So, for example, let me give you an example. I'll, I'll use English 10 honors as an example. So we have Sue here and she's familiar with English 10 honors. So, so let's say we have 16 students in English 10 honors and 6 of them have selected to go virtual. So, what we will do, we're putting the in person hybrid students on 1 day. Let's say, okay, they'll be blue. And then the virtual day will be the students. Um, who have opted to be virtual will be on the gold day. So the, the teacher in English 10 honors, it's Mrs. Ball. She'll have students in front of her on blue day. They'll, they'll be there in the school. And then on the gold day, she'll be broadcasting out from her classroom with no students in there, but broadcasting out through either Zoom or Google um, to those students so they get the live instruction. So those students will have what we call the live day, the, the synchronous day. And then the next day will be asynchronous where they'll have um, maybe a pre recorded lesson. Um, they'll have projects they'll be working on um, or they'll have assignments. So, so that is the model. Um, special education students, students with IEPs may have indirect consulting in some courses. So, so we're still working out those details. So at the middle school, the plan is going to be very similar. So our every other day model actually worked out perfectly for the virtual instruction. So again, students will have um, a live teacher lesson, okay, through either Zoom or Google Meet on one day. And then the next day, um, they'll have their, their asynchronous lessons, which could be placed, which will be placed in Schoology. Um, so the students can see, parents can see easy access. So at the middle school, an emphasis will be placed on ELA, math, science, social studies, and foreign language. I, I missed a, a comma there. And uh, we're coordinating potential virtual special classes right now. So we're still working on the specials and what that will look like. And again, special education students will receive direct and indirect supports. Um, and we're able to accommodate all of our regions courses and our advanced courses at the middle school. Um, some students may have to make uh, a choice right now, but, but that's a small numbers and we're still working out those details. Now, elementary, so elementary, um, and you saw the numbers. So we are looking district wide at creating virtual grade level classes. For example, um, kindergarten will have um, a, a kindergarten teacher who will have students from all 3 elementary schools. Um, students obviously will still be, you know, attached to their elementary school. Uh, so they will be using Zoom um, at the elementary levels. Again, the teacher will be located in a space, um, hopefully in that same classroom where the teacher is used to being and uh, broadcasting out to the students who are at home. So the virtual teacher will be taking daily attendance. Again, we'll, we'll continue to use Google Classroom. Um, and the day will be structured as follows. Again, we're still working out these details, um, but it's really important that the day mirrors the day of our in-person um, students so that we can follow the same curriculum maps and it, it may look differently, but we need to keep everybody on pace and at the same pace. So uh, two hours of ELA, an hour of math, and then we'll be dividing up the hour and 45 minutes between um, you know, blocks of time. So one week it could be social studies, could be uh, uh, science. Um, definitely we're including social emotional learning and all of this and, and anything else. Uh, students will have breaks, uh, a break from 1130 to 1230. Uh, will the, they'll have lunch and specials. So specials, we're still figuring out what specials will look like, uh, but we also think there'll be some kind of um, pre-recorded uh, project-based um, um, instructions that will be posted on Google Classroom. So technology, so we did get some Chromebooks that arrived to the middle school. So we're excited about that because as you know, there is a problem with the supply chain and Sylvie, our director of technology has been calling vendors everywhere, trying to see if there's any way we can get um, our shipment in or another shipment in. Um, so, so that's proving to be difficult, not just for us, but for um, I think almost every single school district in, in the country. So, but we were able to get um, a middle school shipment. Um, 
We ordered 60 for the middle school. We got 58 in on Friday. So we're excited. So hopefully uh, they'll keep coming. We are sending out a parent square survey this evening. Actually, I recorded my voice. So parents may think I'm doing two things at once. Uh, so we are um, trying to determine how many uh, devices there are in the home. What about access to home internet? So we are up, um, updating our technology access survey. So it's being sent out tonight and it will close next Friday. So we're giving parents a little bit more than a week to um, answer those questions and, and we'll fill one out by child in the district so that we can assess their needs. Kajit, so Kajit is offering something special for New York State at a special rate. So we did place an order through BOCES for MiFi hotspot spots for our homeless students. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to order more, but um, we were able to order 24. BOCES and Spectrum are forming a partnership to offer home internet. So that's new and I will keep you updated on what this will look like. Uh, another low cost option um, brokered by BOCES. So, so that's an interesting option right there. And Chromebook distribution day for our virtual students will be scheduled prior to the first day of school. So our um, policy hasn't changed. It will still be one limit per family. Um, only because we won't have enough Chromebooks um, for in, in person instruction and for virtual instruction, um, unless we do provide some limitations, especially since our order has not been fully received at this time. So I do have some health and safety updates to report. So students, parents, and guardians will receive the health screening questionnaire each morning through Parent Square. Um, so we're asking parents to answer the questions as well as attest to uh, their children not having a temperature. So in Parent Square, we weren't able to customize it at this point just to ask for information about temperature taking. So that's why we, we had to, uh, to um, basically uh, engage in the full questionnaire each day. But what we are doing is that uh, we are looking to purchase self-service thermal scanners, which can eff effectively and efficiently take temperatures faster and more um, with uh, non-contact. So, so Sylvie, so we had a demonstration, a demonstration, Sylvie, um, Stacy, and I, and uh, we think it will be a, a definitely much needed solution to try to logistically handle the students whose parents don't take a temperature. And what we're hoping is that we can morph into um, this being the, you know, the sole um, instrument and, and method instead of sending out, you know, relying on parents to respond about the temperature. So, so that is something we're, we're working on and we're hoping we can have it in place in this, the beginning of the school year. Um, but in the meantime, we'll still continue to push out um, the notifications through Parent Square. So mask breaks, I know that was a big topic at our last meeting and our principals are continuing to work with our teachers um, as well as uh, Dr. DeTerzi on um, what will be our protocols uh, during the school day. So I would like to turn it over to Stacey Mackey. So just a quick update on the CARES Act. Um, I just wanna start off that the CARES Act uh, funding is not new funding, um, not new money. So during the budget process, you might recall uh, the last state aid run included a pandemic adjustment, and then it also included a federal CARES restoration line item. So the pandemic adjustment was for 598,000 and the restoration was for that same dollar amount. So this, uh, these allocations uh, we're already included in the revenue budget. So please, if, if you take anything away from the, the next two slides, it's that this is not new money. Um, so there's two different forms uh, of funding. Uh, we do have to apply for it. We do have to submit an FS10. Initially, these were due uh, August 15th. We just received word 
uh, just before 4 o'clock today that that deadline has been extended to August 31st. Uh, so we do have the draft FS10s prepared and the plan was to uh, draft the uh, application tomorrow. So we're going to go ahead and move forward with that. So we're in very good shape. Uh, so the, the ESSER allocation, what is it? So it's Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. And this is actually awarded by the U.S. Uh, Education Department. And it's for the purpose of um, to address COVID, uh, the impact of COVID for schools. And only schools that received Title I Part A subgrants in the 1920 school year are eligible for this allocation. So our allocation is uh, just over 514,000. And our spending plan, so again, this would be items that uh, were budgeted for or, or in some cases not budgeted for, but we know we need to spend the funds. Um, so classroom teachers. Uh, you might recall during the budget process, we uh, were going to convert classroom teachers to AIS teachers at the elementary level. Uh, with the COVID uh, pandemic, we are um, able to use, uh, convert those AIS teachers back to elementary classrooms to provide additional sections in order to reduce class sizes to accommodate for social distancing. Uh, technology, you might recall the integration specialist uh, is, we found out this spring when we closed, that's a, a really uh, necessary uh, function for the virtual uh, learning environment. Uh, also technology hardware, so Chromebooks um, for students. And also um, uh, webcams for uh, distance learning in the virtual environment. Parent Square is a new software that was purchased. We're using that for health screening and a communication tool. We're uh, conducting surveys through that, through that uh, software. Uh, we had some summer learning, some additional uh, expenditures that we hadn't planned for. This is supplemental tutoring uh, required for uh, some 12th graders that needed to meet the graduation requirements under the current environment. Uh, also, our guidance department requires additional days to modify the scheduling in order to accommodate remote learning opportunities. And then building supplies, cleaning and sanitation supplies, so alcohol, um, ster you know, sterilizing alcohol wipes, uh, disinfectant wipes, hand sanitizers, face shields, uh, gloves, gowns, etc. So next slide, please. So the second piece uh, of the allocation is gear, the gear allocation. So uh, we're just, a, just about 87,000. So what is this? This is the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. So this was actually uh, authorized by the CARE Act and for New York State, Governor Cuomo allocated the state's entire allowance, which was 164 million statewide, uh, all to schools. So. Uh, our spending plan for this allocation, uh, you might recall, uh, I think maybe in June, uh, we accepted a donation of wireless devices. We're going to use those uh, externally on the buildings uh, for community use. So this would be uh, allocated for the installation of those wireless access points. And then also hardware and software purchases for technology. Uh, specifically Chromebooks for students and for, uh, we had to add some additional instructional space, so interactive boards uh, for those new teaching spaces. And then, uh, as you may recall, we haven't received our pre-K allocations yet, so we will have a local share of pre-K expenses to be determined. Uh, we've earmarked it for a portion of the nurse's salary. Uh, at this time. So we're not, again, we're not sure what the pre-K allocation is going to be for the year, but we, we do uh, suspect that there will be some local share that, that was not planned. Uh, are there any questions regarding uh, the CARES Act or the, the two different uh, allocation funds? Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Any other questions from the board on any other part of the presentation? This is Sue. I have some questions. 
Um, how will the staff or administration know if a student has been screened each day? How are they notified? So we do have the screening process um, where uh, we will be able to get the information from Parent Square, um, but it is cumbersome. That's why we are looking to order the thermal scanners because uh, we do believe that the best uh, scenario is to scan everyone who comes on our campus and is about to enter our buildings. So that is the goal. And um, so at first it will be a combination. So we, we, that's why we'll be using the thermal scanners. Also, you know, the hand, the hand temperature uh, takers um, and then the parent app. So, so hopefully with that three combination, we'll be able to logistically handle this when we start school. And then we will transition solely to using um, the temperature taking at in our buildings. So when the student arrives at school, they enter the school and they're asked if their temperature has been taken at home. Is that how that's? No, happening? we have a list. We'll have a list. A list of? Students whose temperatures were not taken, whose parents did not submit a form. Okay, all right. Um, so then those, if they didn't uh, submit a form, they'll be screened every day. Correct. They'll get their temperature taken every day. Yep. So we're assuming then that those who did fill out the form have already been screened at home. If a parent attests um, that the child um, does not have any COVID related symptoms and does not have a fever of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or greater, then um, that is correct. We would not take the child's temperature at school. And the parent attests every day. Well, the parent will attest every day um, until we can, well, so first of all, we yeah, will yeah. send the questionnaire. We have to, we're required to send it periodically. Right. But we, we will be sending it every single day only because Parent Square isn't allowing us to customize the question so that it would only focus on temperature taking. So that's why the parents then must answer all of the questions. Okay, so that's one piece of it. And until we can transition fully to taking temperatures in our buildings at our entrances, um, we will have to use a combination of both. Okay, so I'm just I'm just trying to clarify for myself and others. So when the bell rings in the morning, it you know, or the or the elementary kids are let in or the bells ring into middle school and high school. The kids come into school, they just come in and go right to their classes. No, they don't they don't enter the building and go into their classes if we don't know whether or not they have a temperature. That doesn't happen. So okay, so by first period, the teacher will know if a child is not coming to their class or um it, so so kids aren't going to be allowed in the building if they have a temperature. We'll know that at the entrance. Well, that's what I mean. You'll know that before they enter the building. Yes, and they'll be actually they'll be sent to the isolation room. I hate to make it sound like that, but we do have a room um, that has been designated for students who are exhibiting symptoms of illness, um, as opposed to students who need to go to the nurse's office for other reasons, like getting meds or maybe I, they skipped their knee or something like that. Okay, but so we, we understand this is cumbersome, which is exactly why we want to do all the temperatures in school. So that's what we're moving to. Okay, but so we won't be there completely. I'm sorry, is the nurse involved in the morning? Uh, no, we'll have, no, the nurse is there to okay. receive people okay. um, in case someone is exhibiting symptoms. So, okay. so we'll, we'll have teams um, and we will have the nurses train them on how to utilize this equipment to take the temperatures. And um, for example, I think that uh, so, at the at the high school, Principal Tarlow is talking about three different entrances. Okay, I know at each one of our buildings there are multiple entrances in the morning, and at each entrance there will be a team of people who are, you know, whatever taking temperatures. Now I love these new this new system because basically you put your hand under it, and it automatically takes your temperature. It's quick, so you know that's quick. So that's what we are. Um, looking to utilize. 
So are, are we envisioning a line in the morning waiting? So, so again, um, we're, we have to take temperature. Students will have to social distance in the lines. Right. Um, and we do have the uh, handheld. Um, Stacy, can I ask how many do we have for each building of the handheld, you know, infrared ones? Two to three, minimum of two, possibly three per building. Okay, so if there are three entrances, we would technically need three screening tools. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. But we don't have three, perhaps. I, I just, I'm wondering, I just wonder when first period is going to begin. That's all. I just, you know, I know there's a lot to work out. I get that. I just had a lot of questions on how this is right. going to work. So and for the teams. Right. So, so the handhelds came today, actually. Uh, they were they were delivered today, and I think we looked at that and we, uh, Stacy, do we have some additional to begin with, or was that our first ship? I ordered I ordered two per location. Yep. And I was under the assumption that each location had one to start. Right. Um, so. But I don't I don't want to say for sure each building has three. They have at least two, but I would assume three. And, and we do have follow up. And we're waiting um, for the other devices that we're planning on. And so who are the teams? Who are the teams? Are they um, like guidance counselor? Who will be doing this? Well, I know the principal is working internally, um, the principals, to identify those teams. Okay. I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry. I just have a lot of questions about it. That's all. Thank you. Hey, this is Pete. Hi, Pete. I just have I just have a couple of questions. Um, the isolation room for anybody that may be exhibiting uh, signs and symptoms. Um, who will be monitoring that? And do we have uh, the correct PPE for um, whomever that may be? Yeah. So it will be our school nurses, and um, we, uh, Stacy. Do you want to talk about? I believe they're getting fitted for an N95 so that they'll have the appropriate. Um, PPE to be able to safely um, attend to students who may be exhibiting symptoms? So they will have a face mask, they will have a face shield, they will have a gown, they will have gloves. If they would like an N95, they have that option. Absolutely, they have them. That's great. Thank you. Just one more question as well. The um... Uh, the attestations for um, for when the kids come in in the morning. What do we? Is there a protocol for if the kids are being dropped off late or being picked up? I mean, are parents going to be allowed into the building? Is somebody going to walk the kids out? And if that protocol exists, mm -hmm. has it been made public? So um, we will have our parent meetings next week, and all of the principals will be talking about first of all, what is our elementary plan, middle school, and high school. And then also specifics such as this. So, first of all, we do have a um, have decided that parents will not be allowed to enter the building. So we are working on those procedures when students do come late. Um, and we are going to close the survey um, or the the app each morning. But again, we could take a temperature of a, of a child who comes in late as well. So that that's not a worry. Thank you very much. Uh, th this is Mark. There, there's uh, there's times that that I miss being a school counselor. Th this is not one of them. I can't I, I you know I can't imagine. No educator has ever had a summer like this, and uh, I just want to express my appreciation to Dr. Spring and her team. I just can't uh, I, I can't imagine um, the the how this summer how this summer is going. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple of things that aren't new, but I, ju I just uh, want to emphasize and, and bring them up again. Uh, I'm, I'm really wondering about these uh, younger elementary school kids, kindergartners, first graders, second graders. We really don't have a way to know how accustomed they are to, to have a mask on for this, this duration of time. And I know Rick, Rick said kids are resilient, and he's right, they are resilient, but we just, we just don't know 
uh, how these how these small children uh, are going to handle this. And again, we don't know how, how much mask time they they've spent. So uh, I, I know the mask breaks are part of the plan. I just I wish you all luck with that. But I'm also hoping that, that we do revisit this uh, sooner rather than later because we're going to learn a lot. We're going to learn a lot that first week or so. And and we just don't. There, there's no playbook here. No one's ever been through this before. So I I think that the the our our administrators, our committees, uh, are are doing the absolute best they can. But there's just a, a lot we're we're not we're not going to know until uh, in, until school opens. Uh, I, I'd also like to bring up the uh, the attention to air quality, which which we haven't been hearing a lot about, but have been hearing more and more. Recently, uh, I appreciate the help that we've got from former board member Jeremy McDonald. Uh, he certainly has expertise in this area, and and I know we've looked at it. And I just I expect and I hope that that will continue to be a a real emphasis that is becoming more and more prominent, and more important as we as we fight this this virus. Uh, but again, just hoping that that we we take a look to see how things are going across the board. But I, I especially I'm concerned about the the youngest uh, of our kids. Um, but again, want want to want to thank everyone for all, all the spending on this summer. So I, I think I did communicate. We are meeting with CSR, our our architects, on Friday, and we are discussing again what can we do again um, without a capital project, right? To uh, you know to address some of those those issues. So so we are looking at that. Um, and we did, uh, we do have a plan for elementary mass breaks, um, and we're still working out those details, but I'm very confident that it, it will all work out for kids. And um, according to uh, Karen Renessi and Aaron Hill, our directors for our summer ESY program, um, the kids have had mass breaks. Again, it's, it's a, a half day program, um, and they've transitioned very well to them. Any other questions from board members for anything on the agenda or from uh, the presentations? Hi, this is Pete. Um, it's not necessarily a question. Um, I just want to publicly state that uh, um, my appreciation for all the teachers and the staff that have been on this ve these various committees that have getting these uh, protocols together and uh, trying to hash out the details in a very short space of time. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Pete. Uh, with that, I know that as far as comments on the agenda, I wanted to thank Stewart's for their uh, fairly substantial donation to the district for art supplies. And um, if there are no other questions, then I'll ask for a uh, motion for to accept the consent agenda. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Mr. Pascal. Yes. Mr. Jackson. Yes. Mrs. Dion. Mrs. Carey. Yes. Mr. Annalee. Yes. Mr. Nolan. Yes. I haven't any, uh, I was just checking, I haven't received any public comments for this evening. If there are any other comments for um, anything at all outside of the, you know, agenda or anything, I know that we have started talking about having the meeting, our next meeting at the end of the month, perhaps in person, at least as far as those that are on the board and on our admin team but we'll keep folks comprised of what that will look like as we move forward. But that is the direction we're moving in at the moment. Are there any other comments from the board? Okay, 
Uh, with that, our, our next meeting is August 26th. And as I mentioned, um, that'll still be, the plan is for that to still be live streamed from the public participation perspective, but the board itself may convene together. Um, we're still working on that. And as uh, everyone knows, things change pretty regularly, but that's the current plan. And um, with that being said, we can, um, I'll ask for, we can close out the meeting at 6.45. Wait a minute, we can't have a 45 minute meeting. That's just, that's not us. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> mute work. I, I would like to just uh, echo what was uh, stated by Pete and others about the dedication from our, our staff and everyone involved. It's, you know, it's unprecedented times and uh, everyone's learning as we go. Um, and we're, we're doing what we, we can uh, with what we what we have. And I really admire everyone, you know, putting the effort that they have been going above and beyond to make this as uh, best an experience as possible while maintaining everyone's safety, which is of paramount importance. So with that, uh, we can end today's meeting at 6.46, so it wasn't 45 minutes. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have all. a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. Have a good night.